Hi, my name is Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging, and in this upcoming video, I am speaking to our mighty May. She is a veterinarian out of Los Angeles who is also a proponent of vegan diets for dogs. And the reason why I sat down with her was because of a current plan or proposal to switch dogs in LA shelters to a vegan kibble. So um, this conversation is something that is passionate for a lot of people, or this idea. There are people who very passionately believe that dogs can survive and thrive off a vegan diet, and there are people who believe otherwise. I personally think dogs are faculative carnivores, which means that they thrive on a diet of muscle meat, um, organ meat, and bone, So, which is why I'm a raw feeder, but they can thrive off of um, a temporary diet of vegetation, depending upon what's available. However, um, I try to approach new ideas with an open mind because I'm always open to learning new things. And so I was really excited to sit down with our mighty. This video may disappoint some people because I think a lot of people got the impression when I announced that I was going to be meeting with someone on this topic that it would be kind of a house, real housewives smackdown where I'm cutting down their theories. And it's not like that at all. I believe that as animal lovers, we can always sit down and have a respectful discussion, even if we disagree on a topic. And that's what Armidi and I had here. This is a long video. You're going to notice that I'm a little nervous because um, speaking with someone from the vegan circle, I actually was really nervous about doing this because um, I had some interactions with people who were so very passionate about this topic that you know, I nearly canceled the interview. But um, Armighty was wonderful, just the most um, engaging and open and friendly person I've ever connected with. I was really excited to talk to her. I wanted to continue talking to her. Um, I think I spoke too much, which you'll see. But um, I did not get all my questions asked because I think I made too long of a list and just got ahead of myself. But I think I learned a lot about what they are trying to do down in LA. I learned a lot about how people feel about um, feeding their dogs a vegan diet. And I was pleasantly surprised that this isn't just about um, a moral issue of killing animals to feed another animal. There's a lot more involved. And I hope you guys can see that too. So I hope you enjoy the video. And so, hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging. And I am here with, can you, I know your last name is May because I was born in May, but it's Armaida? Armaidi, May. Armaide. Armaidi. Armaidi May. That's horrible. I just did a horrible job. Who is a vegan veterinarian who also yes. is a proponent of vegan diets for dogs. And the reason why I'm here today is speaking with Armaide May. Armaidi. 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 <laughs> I'm going to get it before we're finished. It's because in LA County, there is a proposal on the docket for um, switching the food in the shelters to vegan kibble. And um, while that's not my, um, my bailiwick, I'm a raw feeder. I live in Washington State. I mean, why am I even interested in this? What got me most interested in it is basically the passion behind it on both sides. And the reason why is because as a raw feeder, um, I recognize that passion because I have the same passion, the passion in what I feed my dogs. And I also get a lot of pushback from different communities who are, you know, who will aggressively tell me that I'm wrong and um, don't really want to sit down and talk with me. And the other thing is I'm, I always like to take a step back. I mean, I can look at something and say, no, that's wrong. But I also want to take a step back and recognize that we're all animal lovers. So if we could at least start from a place of animal lovers and the fact that we're adults, we should always be able to sit down and have a conversation sharing ideas that are, you know, we may not always agree about just in an attempt to, I think, learn something new. Right. I listened to um, not only there was a Facebook Live with Commissioner Wilson, but also, um, I don't know if you would call it his testimony, but um, which was, I felt very compelling and I wrote a blog post about it because I saw that he touched on a lot of things that I think maybe not everyone wants to accept, but I think we all understand is that, you know, in a world in which we're raising cattle in order to feed a globe, which, you know, ironic with so much people, so many people going hungry, 
but we're raising all these animals and it is having a detrimental impact on our environment. And, you know, the idea of, um, this is why I started, you know, earlier this year, really becoming serious about, it. I think becoming a vegetarian has been something that's always been in my mind for decades because I am an animal lover. The more, um, once you, uns once you see things, you can't unsee them. So the more you learn about factory farming and how the animals are treated and managed, it makes it difficult to support that by eating the meat that's produced by those industries. So it's been something that I've been thinking about for years, but once I switch my dogs to a raw diet, I am of the belief that my dogs are faculative carnivores in that they um, will thrive better on a meat-based diet, but I am an omnivore. I don't need to eat a meat-based diet so why would I support um, why would I support an industry when I don't need to eat from that industry? And so that's my desire to become a veterinarian um, or veterinarian, <laughs> a vegetarian. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but um, with you know the vegan diets for dogs, you know I've heard of it, and initially for me, I thought it was for dogs that were basically allergic to everything. And so hey, why don't we switch them to a vegan diet? And then we're seeing dogs that taking off all of these proteins that um, basically are animals that were fed <laughs> grains and, you know, pump full of antibiotics and things processed into a kibble and then their feet going into our dogs and our dogs are developing allergies to these animals, um, feed them a vegan diet and all of a sudden we're seeing dogs that are doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. But that's as far as I thought vegan um, diets went. I never actually considered, um, changing a dog's diet to just strictly vegan. So what I wanted to talk to you about is other than the idea of other animals dying for this animal to thrive, what are the benefits of a vegan diet for dogs? Thank you and I appreciate the opportunity to address this topic. I think it is important for us to think about food, what we're feeding our animal companions and what goes into that food. Currently the meat byproducts that are in most meat-based dog foods are from the worst of the worst of you know the rejects from the slaughterhouse that have disease lesions that are not deemed fit for human consumption not that I would want to eat it because I'm vegan but for pets to be receiving this food over and over again throughout the course of their lives it does have an impact we also have studies which have shown alarmingly high levels of heavy metal contamination um, in the form of arsenic in chicken, mercury in seafood, and many other petrochemicals which are highly concentrated due to the virtue of bioaccumulation, which occurs when you have a species eating another animal species, those toxins that the first animal, the herbivorous animal ate, gets concentrated into their fatty tissue. Mm -hmm. And so even though there are toxins all around us, which is somewhat unavoidable and we only can do the best that we can do, and, and that's true, we can vastly limit our exposure to those toxins by eating lower on the food chain, regardless of whether the product is organic or not organic. It is, is a, a huge exposure that our dog and cat companions are receiving in the form of petrochemicals and other uh, pollutants that are what, what are called persistent organic pollutants. And they include literally hundreds of chemicals. So when I am a vet, I've been practicing in Los Angeles for close to 12 years now. I do house calls, but I, I've seen a lot of dogs dying from cancer. It's really an epidemic now, like one in two dogs who are dying from cancer. So that to me is very concerning and we need to look at like what could be contributing to that even at young ages i mean i've seen dogs that are just one or two years of age getting afflicted with cancer and that doesn't seem normal to me there, there's got to be something that's causing that um that that could be addressed and corrected so i attended a conference uh, about a year ago and i became aware of some really interesting information concerning the carcinogens and other chemical toxins that were found. Uh, an environmental working group study reported in the New York Times tested the pool of blood and urine samples from 20 dogs and 37 cats at Virginia Veterinary Clinic and found them contaminated 
with 48 of 70 industrial chemicals tested. 43 were at levels substantially higher than found in people. And those included plastics, food packaging chemicals, heavy metals, fire retardants, as well as stain proofing chemicals. And for the dogs who were tested, uh, they were contaminated with 35 chemicals altogether, including 11 carcinogens, 31 chemicals toxic to the reproductive system, and 24 neurotoxins. 20% of those chemicals averaged at least five times higher than what is found in people. So, uh, and, and you know, there are other studies too, and I can go on, but um, the point is that what we're feeding our animals is, is really toxic. And so if we can shift them to something that is pure, that's definitely the preferred option. And it's been shown that even though dogs have eaten meat in the past and do eat meat when they're given the opportunity, they can actually thrive on a well-balanced plant-based diet that meets their nutritional requirements. So dogs, while they're omnivores, they, they can do very well on plant-based foods because they have the enzymes for digesting carbohydrates, which wolves do not have as much of. Uh, and some of the studies have shown over the evolution of the 10,000 years that dogs became domesticated and lived with humans, they actually developed the ability to digest carbohydrates and have many, many more genes than wolves do for doing so. So, um, and then in my travels over the past several years and doing volunteer work in various third world countries, I've seen dogs that are existing. I mean, they may not be in the perfect health because they don't get enough food in many cases. Stray dogs, you know, sadly, uh, unlike a lot of dogs in the United States who get too much food and are obese. So, you know, they're both types of issues that go on. But dogs are adaptable. I mean, they, they can survive on all kinds of different diets. Uh, there, there are dogs in India who don't eat any meat at all because they're entire cities that don't even have meat allowed. It's like there are vegetarian cities in India, such as Rishikesh, where meat is banned. And there are dogs, I, I visited Rishikesh myself and I saw them running around. So um, this idea that dogs must have meat to survive or to do well is just, it's just not the reality. I've also seen in clinical practice, you know, here in the U.S., treating dogs that there, there are a lot of skin allergies that we see in clinical practice in the form of licking, biting, chewing, hot spots, all that stuff. And there could be multiple factors, certainly environmental uh, contact allergies, food sensitivities are a part of that, and flea allergies. So I've, I've seen improvements in dogs who switch to a plant-based diet in their skin allergies. And interestingly, uh, one of the actual official prescription veterinary diets for allergic dogs is a vegetarian formula. It's made by a company called Purina, which you've probably heard of. And uh, Purina HA is the name of the diet. It's a hypoallergenic diet, and it's, it's all plant ingredients. So, and that's, that's well known amongst veterinary nutritionists that that diet exists and it is what's called a prescription diet. So if that diet is deemed suitable, and there are many other that are AFCO approved, meaning they have the stamp of approval from the American Association of Beak Control Officials in terms of meeting the requirements that dogs have, then, you know, let's do it. And it, there are many benefits for the environment. I mean, what's happening, we're seeing so many natural disasters, these fires and floods that happened just a few months ago and hurricanes, those are largely contributed to by climate change, which the livestock industry is a big contributor towards. The, the livestock um, greenhouse gas emissions, the methane, are actually uh, hugely significant, more so than all of transportation combined. And we're, we're, we're really in a crisis right now with the depletion of natural resources, the, the water use, the land use, the, the depletion of uh, rainforests that are a reservoir for amazing uh, soils that provide nutrition for all kinds of species, animal, plant species that are being decimated to make room for cattle grazing and to grow crops to feed cattle. So it's, uh, it's very environmentally destructive to feed a diet that isn't necessary to be fed when there is a kinder and more environmentally friendly and 
frankly healthier option available in the form of a nutritionally complete plant-based option. Um, another thing that I, a reader said to me recently when I started just asking questions about this was when it comes to the shelter system, and this kind of touches on what you said, the food that's being fed to dogs in the shelter system, where I am, a lot of the shelters will only um, accept kibble of a certain standard. They won't accept the super low quality kibble because it does make the dog sick. It, you know, and a sick dog is not gonna be a dog that someone wants to adopt and take home. Mm -hmm. Or a sick dog is just going to get sicker when they go home and get switched to a different food. So they wanna keep the dogs as healthy as possible. So they will only accept high quality kibble. But not every area of the country has that um, ability to be so strict. And so dogs are being fed. Um, what you mentioned is basically the scraps, the stuff on the ground in these slaughterhouses that we wouldn't eat and wouldn't be in our food chain, but they're not going to throw it away. So they throw it into the dog food chain. And that is making an impact on our dogs. And I agree with the, um, that the chemicals and the toxins that are going into these animals, the, um, the 3D and 4D meat that are going into the pet food supply chain and is now being eaten by our pets is creating generation after generation of dogs with cancer. You mentioned knowing dogs that were one and two years old that had cancer. Um, a few weeks ago, I saw a Facebook post of a puppy that had cancer, you know, and, you know, less than, I think four months old. And wow. it's just sort of like, there obviously something is going wrong and something needs to be addressed in that. Them the kibble and it's not always going to be the highest quality kibble and so we are adopting out sick dogs or we're housing sick dogs and one person one of my readers said to me isn't a high quality vegan food superior than the lowest quality kibble wouldn't it be better and that blew my mind because I didn't think of it that way all I all I couldn't get I couldn't get out of the box of dogs are carnivores this is wrong and when someone said that to me, it made me take a step back of, well, one, I'm an accountant. So, I mean, I'm not one to, to really speak on dog health and anatomy and things like that. But also, it is something where I'm not willing or no longer willing to hold on to the idea that dogs can only eat meat, especially as you said, you're talking about places around the world, which makes perfect sense to me that if meat isn't available and... I believe that dogs are faculative carnivores, which means that they will eat what is available to them. So this isn't so out of place, but that long rant was um, about the ingredients in vegan kibble. You know, when it comes to cancer, I'm looking at vegan kibble and while um, it seems like the carbs would be super high in a vegan kibble, when I did the math on a few of the brands, the carbs are actually in line or lower than a lot of the meat-based kibbles that are being donated to the dog food. Dog food. But um, with the grains and the starch in the kibble, and you know, right now, you know, with the Truth About Pet Food series, pet food series that came out, people are learning that carbs feed, you know, turn into sugar, turn into glucose, feed cancer, feed tumors. Isn't there um, a negative correlation between a kibble diet or a vegan diet from kibble and then cancer in dogs? Well, in my experience, the, the grains that are sourced, first of all, are not genetically modified. And that's important because if they're GMO, that would be more of a concern. And I think in the junkier brands that have byproducts, you are going to find GMO, soy, corn, et cetera, which is concerning. So the, the brands that are being suggested as alternatives to what the shelter system in LA is currently feeding, which is Canada, and the first ingredient is chicken meal, which has all the byproducts from the slaughter of chickens that are not fit for human consumption ground together. That's, that's the first ingredient of the food. I mean, and chicken, as I mentioned earlier, is a chief reservoir of arsenic, which is considered a group one carcinogen. So that to me is, is clearly a less favorable option than a plant-based kibble. 
that has legumes as the principal protein source. And legumes also have fiber, which help eliminate toxins from the system. And that's, that is why dogs who are on plant-based kibbles have more voluminous stools, which is a healthier stool, actually, than a constipated dry, hard stool. And some of the dogs that are not eating enough fiber could get constipated and have more toxin accumulation in their bodies. So I think um, the important thing is that the ingredients be pure as far as feasible. And of course, we don't live in a perfect world, so it's not always feasible financially. But as far as is economically uh, attainable to have the ingredients be sourced from, from good sources, uh, that will eliminate some of those problems. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the concentration of toxins in the animal-based foods is much higher than any of the plant-based okay. ingredients. Okay. And so you, you, when you said like the chickens are a reservoir of arsenic, um, is that why we're seeing so many dogs with chicken allergies or chicken intolerance? Um, you know, that is a, a much more complicated question. And there are different theories that are out there about what causes allergies you know, skin allergies in dogs. And I, I think it, it could have to do with a lot of different factors, including possibly over vaccination. But um, that's, that's more of a conjecture than a, you know, I, that's not really pertinent to, you know, what we're going to do about the problem other than I mean, there are some people out there that are trying to do some natural allergy elimination technique, I, I haven't had personal experience with that in my practice. But um, I mean, the fact is that chicken and beef and, and other animal proteins are very highly allergenic for a lot of dogs. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Purina HA, which is a hypoallergenic vegetarian formula, has been prescribed as a prescription diet for so many dogs. So when I see dogs who have skin allergies, I say, hey, save yourself some money. Instead of supporting this big uh, conglomerate, why not? choose a vegetarian diet that you can get over the counter without a prescription and you're going to save yourself some money or if you want to cook for your dog that's even better and a lot of people do cook at oh. home and that would be the the way to make it the purest possible ingredients right but then they do want to be mindful of the balance and you know consult with a, a veterinarian or a veterinary nutritionist and get guidance about the right proportions and make sure they're supplementing appropriately and when you said about the, the stool being bigger, one thing that I noticed is that, you know, my dog's stool is not super small, but it's smaller. Um, I have four dogs, my two adult dogs, and when they were on a kibble diet, and um, I always thought that it was because they weren't absorbing all of the nutrients in the diet. So everything was just basically being flushed out in the stool. So I guess what's the difference? I don't see where there would be a really big difference between um, dogs eating a, a poor quality meat-based kibble diet in that size of the stool than the, um, a, a vegan kibble diet? Well, fiber, soluble and insoluble fiber are both really helpful to eliminate any toxins and buildup that, that resides in the colon and other, you know, just even through the bile duct. I mean, it just processes out a lot of chemicals and those get excreted out of the system, the more fiber there is. I mean, up to a point, you don't want to do too much fiber either because that, that can then um, block absorption of certain nutrients. But the, the fiber is well-regulated in the approved foods. And by the way, as far as your comment earlier about AFCO, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that AFCO is the end-all be-all of veterinary nutrition. They do serve as a governing body that oversees the basic nutrient profiles of dog and cat food. So for, for that purpose, they serve a purpose of kind of giving a yardstick for us to at least attain a, a basic minimal level of quality and ingredient that are meeting those standards. But that doesn't mean just because it's AFCO approved that it's a wonderful diet. Not at all. I mean, there are a lot of kibble that are meat-based that have a lot of toxins that are AFCO approved. That doesn't mean that they're, they're great diets. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm not in favor of people just feeding whatever they think they should feed without putting mindfulness into what the ingredients are and ensuring that those are uh, meeting the requirements of dogs, which include fat, carbohydrate, protein, macro, you know, micronutrients, trace minerals, vitamins, just like we have those requirements, you know, they have their own requirements. And so people who do home cook, and I, I have one client who 
home cooked for her dogs from puppyhood as a vegan. And she provided a supplement mix that was available through a um, Harbingers of an Age, which is now called Compassion Circle, compassioncircle.com. She ordered the veggie pup supplement mix and she uh, made the food at home, garbanzo beans, you know, lentils, rice, vegetables, and, she, and the dog's thriving. I mean, he, she's doing great. She's very active and healthy. And, you know, she's about six or seven years old now. She, she raised her from a puppy as vegan. So, and I, I mean, I know a lot of people who are doing that and, and having good results. So it can be done. Okay. And so, gosh, I have so many questions. Um, I'm, I hope you can stay on for like at least 20 more minutes. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I'll try not to make it 20 more, but maybe 15. I um, just, I have so many questions. So about the chicken meal, I do agree that with some of the brands, the chicken meal is basically byproducts with the water taken out and turned into a meal. I always thought well, with Canada, they used whole chicken and they just took the water out, but it was still whole chicken. You know, you'd have to ask the company what they're exactly doing, but from reading the, the labels, when they say it's, when they just say chicken, Right. And that, that's different from chicken meal. I mean, the chicken meal would be the, the byproducts, essentially. And may, maybe there's some meat yeah. in there, too, but it's not the part that they're going to sell for humans to eat. Yeah, I think I, I, that might have been the way it was a few years ago, but there's like a big switch over the past four years where they're taking the, um, I learned this because I used to be a rep for one of the companies, and they're oh. taking the water out because it allows them to put more meat into the kibble. And I, I still think it's like a marketing gimmick on a lot of things because it's just sort of like, it's still being baked to death. And um, I feel like a lot of the nutrients and then, I don't know, I just don't think kibble, um, a lot of the kibble that is on the market is very healthy for dogs. But I do see um, chicken byproduct meal. And that is like when they just take the parts of the chicken that no one wants to eat and then they dry it out and put it in the, products and I try to educate people about the difference between the two but I agree I think it's important that people take a time and give these companies a call and ask them what does this mean so they can understand what their dogs are consuming there was something else that you said um, you know one thing that was mentioned in by Commissioner Wolfson is that he was saying that that you know like the longest living pets are vegan pets and you know and it's like I try to do research to find you know where are these animals and I think, you know, it goes with the, um, the same thing with um, raw feeding, where, you know, it's anecdotal. So it's not like some, someone's raising a flag and writing a blog post for the past few years telling us about their, their animals. But um, how do we know that these aren't just outliers and this is just the norm? I mean, is it, is it going to take more time? Because it feels to me, as someone, this is new to me this year, whereas I know that, you know, I think... Like Halo has had vegan kibble for a few years now, but um, every year that They're I go to one of the ones who's offering to replace yeah, what's going to be I saw that, and and yeah. it's like I every year that I go to Super Zoo, I see like maybe, well, I may not even one more, but it's just a very small market. So it's just sort of like, is it going to take time, or for us to see the benefits of this, or is this known, but it's just basically known in the vegan community. And now it's, we're you're waiting for the rest of the world to catch up. Yeah, that's a great question. There is a need for more uh, funding to do more comprehensive studies. However, we do have some studies already that show that plant-based diets are sufficient and can even dogs can even thrive on them. So there's a, a study um, that was done on uh, sled racing dogs, sprint racing sled dogs. Uh, in November of 2009 in the British Journal of Nutrition, an experimental meat-free diet maintained hematological characteristics in sprint racing sled dogs. So um, then, you know, there, there are other uh, studies which show that they are able to digest plant foods, including grains and starches. So, you know, it would be great if we had more funding available. Part of the issue is that, you know, the, the funding that is available is usually through the companies that provide the meat-based right. food, and so they they're not incentivized to fund you know the studies that we would like to see funded. But you know I think there there certainly is hope in the future for that to happen. But like a lot of things, I've noticed there isn't always uh, funding where we would like it to be when 
the powers at play are not uh, to be benefited by the results of those studies. So right. yeah, I think you have to look at the big picture too. And I mean, like who's studying the cancer epidemic, for example, that, that seems to be falling on deaf ears. So right. we have to kind of like make our own decisions and realize that, you know, that there are thousands of dogs that are thriving, if not more, uh, on plant-based diets. So it can be done, it, you know, and some of the longest lived dogs, like there, there was a, a border collie who lived to be 27, living on lentils, rice, and vegetables. And he made it into the um, Guinness Book of World Records, Bramley is his name. So there, you what know. What was his name? Bramley. 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 Cool. I have a border collie. <laughs> okay. They're very um, smart. So, yeah, too smart. <laughs> so when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to feeding the dogs, basically in the shelter system, um, a vegan diet, you know, one of the things that I wondered is when they leave the shelter system and go to their new home, are the new owners, are, gonna, are they going to be encouraged to continue that diet or, you know, are they going to be helped with transitioning? Is there, do you foresee a problem with transitioning from a vegan diet to a meat-based diet? Or is it like any transition, basically? You're well, I think that starting the, the dogs off on the vegan diet at the shelter is really good to help clients or guardians. I don't like to use the term owner because I don't think we are owners of animals. We're, we're guardians, in my opinion. So, or we should be anyway. But um, anyway, the, the new home, uh, would be in an environment for them to transition to whatever diet the guardian finds suitable. But ideally, it could be an educational moment for those guardians to consider um, continuing a plant-based diet. And if they didn't like feeding the kibble, uh, which is understandable, they could transition them to a home-cooked diet or to a wet food, which I do recommend to clients if they can afford it. But we also have to keep in mind the big picture and being practical, too, because not everyone can afford to do that or has the time to do it. So if it's a question of kill the dog or let them have a home where they're eating kibble, I mean, I think the choice is obvious that the kibble and staying alive is better than being killed. And so um, working with people, just educating them, I think there was talk of having a, a starter kit for dogs to go home with some information and maybe some uh, samples of plant-based kibbles and other foods they could try to see if they can adapt to it. And if, you know, if they're doing well on it in the shelter environment, there's no reason to suspect that they wouldn't do well at home, especially under the guidance of a veterinarian who's counseling them and, you know, checking their blood and seeing if there's any issue. And it's a good idea to have that done annually, regardless of, of what they're eating, but uh, just, to, just to get a, a baseline and then notice if there are issues that crop up before things get out of hand later on. Right, right. And um, is this, you know, this change, is this change basically strictly because of the fact of, you know, how animals are treated in the factory farming system, or is this going to save the shelters money? Because I know that a lot of the kibbles that are making vegan kibbles are high quality, expensive kibbles. And I know that um, they're going to match previous pricing, but they're not giving the food away for free. So is this in any way going to save the shelters any money? Well, right now, the, the prices offered by the, the companies that have stepped forward to offer their vegan kibbles have a uh, price competitive with what the shelter is currently paying. So it should be cost neutral. It may actually be a cost savings. Um, it, they haven't done a full analysis yet, but you know, one could mention that the, the shelter dogs will probably be calmer on a plant-based kibble. Uh, it's been observed in, in people who switch to a plant-based diet that some of the aggression that some people experience before uh, eliminating animal products can dissipate and they actually become uh, more calm uh, on a plant-based diet. So, and, and that has even been shown in, in prison inmates that were fed, um, that were offered you know, plant-based food, that their aggression uh, went down. So, one of the issues that the people in the shelter deal with is all this anxiety. The dogs are barking, they're stressed out, they're just out of their minds. And having them on a diet that relaxes them a little bit will actually make everyone's life easier. Yeah. Has this been tested yet? 
Uh, to my knowledge, I don't know of a, a big shelter system. I mean, Los Angeles is the second biggest shelter system in, in the United States. So uh, I, do, I don't know of any other city that has uh, conducted this type of change. But I mean, on, on an individual level, it has shown success. And so I think, you know, this, it's an idea whose time has come. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited about the, the positive effects that it will have for the dogs and, of course, our planet and the animals who are killed to have to feed another animal. I mean, I think that is a tragedy that could be prevented by, you know, choosing a, a kinder option. And um, are you, at, in the same time, doing any type of work? I mean, I know this is related to the shelter system, but, you know, I feel like um, humans are the biggest consumer of animal. So what are you doing in, in that realm to encourage more humans to at least consider, you know, cutting back or eliminating meat from their diet? Absolutely. I, I have an animal rights meetup group called United Animal Advocates of LA. Uh, we have vegan outreach leafleting on Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. We show videos of, of what happens to animals in factory farms and slaughterhouses. We show portion of a film called Earthlings, directed by Sean Monson and narrated by Joaquin Phoenix, which really has some graphic images and it startles people when they see it and sometimes they stop and you know they sometimes they'll start crying and we show them those videos and we pass out literature to them which has vegan recipes, encourage them to try a plant-based diet. Uh, so we do that every couple weeks. Um, I'm also in a group called Vegan Toastmasters, which is a public speaking club that helps people who are new or aspiring vegans or even just curious about what veganism is all about. And you would be welcome to come. I know you live far away, but you know, if you happen to visit LA sometime, you're welcome to join us. Uh, we meet the first and third Sunday of the month uh, from three to 4.30 in Culver City at Grace Lutheran Church over on Overland Avenue. And it's, it's a great uh, meeting that like-minded people can come together, share ideas, practice their speaking skills, uh, share some lovely vegan food. I also have a nonprofit group called VAPA, which is Veterinary Association for the Protection of Animals we're trying to educate the veterinary community about the benefits of a vegan diet for people to be vegan that's what our focus is on i also hope to get veterinary schools to have more humane surgical teaching methods in their curriculum when i was in vet school at uc davis i helped organize a surgery training wet lab using ethical source cadavers as a humane alternative to what were then terminal surgeries in which dogs would come in from the shelter and subjected to surgeries that weren't necessary and then killed at the end of them. And instead, what's happened now is they have a rotation during senior year in which students perform surgeries under faculty supervision on animals who actually need and benefit from those surgeries at a reduced cost to the client. So it's a win-win all around and that's really how it should be. Also encouraging vet students to go out into the field, volunteer their time, do spaying and neutering in impoverished communities, travel abroad, help out these different communities that do not have access to veterinary care and actually gain a lot of surgical and veterinary clinical experience in the process. Okay, that is it. All right. So much. I, I can't even believe how much I appreciate you taking the time um, to talk to me. Oh, one more final question, I'm sorry. You know, so vegan, so what about leashes and collars and things like that? Those are now fabric-based and, mm -hmm. and... Yeah, there, there are plenty of uh, non-animal uh, leashes and muzzles and I mean I mean I have a whole array of equipment but also it's important to understand that veganism to me is not about perfection mm -hmm. or dogma it's it's about a philosophy of non-injury to other living beings about ahimsa which is reducing suffering and minimizing our impact now I don't pretend to think that as a vegan that I don't have an impact on the environment of course I do but I am here on this planet and I intend to make my time here the best possible I can to, to have as a, least a negative impact and as, as much of a positive impact that I can. So for me, veganism is a tool to reduce suffering and it, it, it also is beneficial for the environment and our health. I mean, as, as a species you know, globally, uh, I think human beings are having a tremendous impact, but that could be curtailed significantly if we were to switch to a plant-based diet. And, and for those who don't want to go vegan, well, they could at least cut back on their intake of animal products and that will help. 
And there's so many wonderful options available of plant-based milks, you know, coconut milk, almond milk, hemp milk, soy milk, and it's available in, in stores easily. Uh, there are a lot of online retailers that have amazing options. And then there are meat alternatives such as Beyond Meat. I don't tend to eat a lot of uh, imitation meats myself, but you know, when you start exploring what's out there and there are 21 day vegan kickstart programs from PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So people get recipes for free in their email box. It's just, the, the doors are wide open. The information is out there. Uh, but once people are aware of it and they see how easy it is, it's, it's not like walking on water to be vegan. You know, you can still fulfill all your favorite taste the tasty foods can be met, <laughs> just the vegan version of it. And, you know, it's, <laughs> you won't be missing out on anything. No sacrifice. <laughs> that's what, that's always been what my fear was, is that, you know, I wasn't going to be healthy and I wasn't going to get everything that I needed. It wasn't going to taste good. And, you know, and it's just like, yeah, it's, it, the, I think as time goes on and with more, um, you know, they have these delivery meal systems that now have the vegetarian and vegan options and they're good. And I started my, our grocery store, I live in a, a smallish town. I'm 45 minutes north of Seattle. Um, our grocery store has a whole healthy food, vegan, vegetarian section, and that's where I shop. And the food is good. And it's just like, it's, it's, I think it's a lot easier than I thought it was like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, definitely. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to ask this earlier. Where is the protein coming from in a vegan kibble? Uh, it could come from chickpeas. It could come from soy, uh, lentils. I mean, a variety of legumes that are used in different kibbles. And does soy have any negative impact on like the hormones of an animal? No, not to my knowledge. The the soy is it has it has a different hormone uh, profile compared to animal flesh. So, okay. animal, by the way meat has hormones naturally occurring in it, even though a lot of times you'll see marketing that says no hormones, but they really mean is no added hormones, because there is a, there are hormones present in the meat food, because it's naturally present. Mm -hmm. So that would actually have a greater impact on health than the plant based hormones. Okay, okay, I'm done with you. Thank, well, thank you so you. much. You're um, welcome some very compelling reasons as to why her choice to feed or, you know, to encourage people to feed a vegan diet to their dogs, why that works. And over the past week in researching and preparing for speaking with her and writing a blog post, which I'll link in the comments, along with a lot of the things that she shared, um, I came across, there are a lot of veterinarians around the country who do help their clients with the vegan diets for dogs. They're not necessarily feeding dogs or encouraging people to feed a vegan kibble to dogs. People are actually making the food at home. And I honestly believe that fresh food, regardless of what you're feeding, is far superior than um, kibble. But after speaking with Armighty, although I have a better understanding of what she's trying to do and where she's coming from, and I'm not so willing to slam the door on a vegan diet, because I think for dogs out there, who um, cannot eat meat, who are having trouble with all the different um, meat-based proteins out there. Based proteins out there, a vegan diet may be an alternative, you know, an expensive alternative, but it is an alternative for that dog. Um, but for me, I just truly believe that dogs are facultative carnivores, that they do best on a meat-based diet. And I'm okay with agreeing to disagree on the subject. And I'm excited that I met a new friend and I'm actually excited to start my own journey to becoming a vegetarian, although I've been on this journey for a while, but to continue because I think that a lot of the reasons why people are um, encouraging people to move to a vegetarian or vegan diet are important reasons, you know, for our environment, for the animals that are in the factory farming systems and, um, you know, for the dogs in the shelter system to Wrap this up, one of my readers said to me, and I said this in the prior video, um, she made a comment on my Facebook page, which I thought was fantastic. And that, fantastic. And that was, is a vegan kibble superior than low quality meat-based kibbles? And 
that is something that really stayed with me for the whole week. And when you think about the ingredients, you go back to the movie Pet Bull, and you think about the ingredients and the sourcing that goes into kibble and then the toxins and everything else that these dogs are being fed, would a temporary diet because I mean, how long are dogs in the shelter system for? I don't know because I'm not familiar with many shelter systems, but how long are they in the shelter system for? And could this vegan diet serve as a cleansing diet? This is an idea that my friend, Dr. Lori Kozier brought up. And it's not to say that this is something that should be done. It's not to say that we agree with it. It's just to say that these are things to think about. Instead of becoming emotional about this topic, I think it's important for us to one, step back and realize that we're all animal lovers here, and two, actually start talking back and forth with each other to get a better understanding of why is this being proposed? Um, how is it gonna benefit people? Who's in it? You know, what's in it for the people, the, the parties involved? So the pet food brands that are donating or giving a discount on the food, are they doing this just out of the goodness of their heart or is this a bigger contract where they're going to now land the LA shelter system and all of the food that is gonna be supplied to the LA shelter system is gonna be one brand? Is this going to be a marketing opportunity for them? Um, or, you know, is this going to be beneficial for the dogs? Um, are we going to see calmer dogs? Or is that something that only happens with humans as far as feeding them a plant-based diet and calming aggression? There's so many questions. There's so many things we don't know that I'm not willing to close the door on it. I'm also not willing to switch my dogs to a vegan diet. But I'm definitely willing to switch my diet to vegetarian. So anyway, I would love to hear your feedback and thoughts on what you think. and if you are willing to um, just basically keep an open mind and, and ask more questions. And I would love to know what you know and what you've heard and who you're speaking to as well. So thanks for watching.